Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and you're very welcome to this week's edition of Farm Business Options. My name is Barry Hassan, Chagas Energy and Rural Development Specialist. Today's topic is the whole area of cut foliage and flower in flower arrangements and the cut flower production industry. Um, I have two guests today, uh, Jim Costello from Farm Hodges and my own colleague Andy Felton from Chagas. Uh, I suppose this is an industry that's probably uh, underappreciated by the casual observer. Fillers and foliage are probably often considered the workhorses or bouquets and they're considered indispensable in the cut flower or the garden or shop industry. Uh, and more often fillers and foliage make up a large proportion of material in any given bouquet of flowers. And we're going to learn a bit more about this industry today. And so that's the whole idea of farm business options is to give you, the viewers, an idea of what are the, maybe the challenges, what are the opportunities in developing a new business. And we've heard many business, about many different businesses over the last number of months. And incidentally, today is the second last episode in the series. So next week, we are going to finish it for the summer period uh, in any case. Um, and we've got a lot of insight into many of the industries over the last uh, number of months. And if any of you want to hear, of, hear or see those webinars, you can see them on chagas.ie forward slash farm business options. And just like those previous ones, today's one has also been recorded and will be available to you afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our, uh, we have, um, we have um, uh, <coughs> a short um, introductory slides here from Andy Felton and from uh, Jim from Forest Produce. And they'll talk a bit about their involvement in the cut foliage industry and where see, they see the opportunities are. There is an opportunity for you to put in your question at the bottom there, to just hover over the bottom and you can put in a question there for Jim or Andy and anything that they're talking about. So they're going to speak in a joint presentation for the first 20 minutes or so. And then at the end of that, uh, we'll be able to take your questions and we'll have a chat about the industry and put your questions to, uh, to, to both of them. So Andy, you're going to share there. Andy is an ornamental specialist in the Agus Horticulture Development Unit, and he's a nursery stock advisor. Andy <clears throat> is a Chagas specialist in cut foliage. He worked with ADAS for seven years in the UK prior to joining Chagas, and he returned home to develop the cut foliage sector, seeing the opportunities. And also, I'll just introduce Jim at this stage. Um, Jim is uh, the Managing Director of Farms Produce Limited, a horticultural company which supplies cut foliage and value-added horticultural products to markets in the UK, Holland, and elsewhere. So without further ado, good morning to you both. Hello, Andy. Morning, Barry. Hello, Jim. Can you hear me, Jim? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Perfect, okay. So guys, well, we, we let, uh, we let uh, Andy go first, and then Jim, you're going to come in after, and uh, we take the questions after that. Thanks, folks. Okay, good stuff. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Barry, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, look, uh, what we'll do is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the production uh, side of uh, cut foliage. And we'll touch a little bit on research and development aspects as well. And then we're going to, Jim is going to pick up on the whole um, business in relation to, you know, Forest Produce, what his company are up to, and uh, the whole market side of the house. So, um, uh, thanks, Barry, again for giving us this opportunity. And uh, I suppose we'll start with basics. I'm, I'm sure some of you are already familiar with with, with what cut foliage is, but for those that aren't, just uh, to say, look, it's, we we're talking basically about the, the the green stems or different coloured stems that can be used in 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 mixed flower bouquets, which basically give fill and uniformity to a to a bouquet arrangement. Uh, the picture shows there's 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 a stem of rhododendron in there with with some gypsophila. The gyp, gyp is is a flower filler, uh, and there's a number of flower fillers. But today we're talking about about uh, Irish uh, green fillers by and large, and just one or two figures I suppose just to to put the thing in context. Uh, we understand that 40% of 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 uh, what you see in terms of bouquets for being sold in supermarkets are mixed bouquets, and 60% of those contain fillers. So uh, we can deduct, I guess, from that, that look, if the, if the greenery wasn't there, uh, they, they wouldn't be able to sell these bouquets. <clears throat> so that's the market. And why are we talking about it here 
in, in, in Ireland, I mean, look, the, the number one thing is that our climate is, 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 is very, very ideal and suitable for growing uh, a lot of the foliages that are demanded by this market. Uh, we have a temperate climate, you know, plenty of rain, long winters and plenty of rain, uh, both summer and winter, and that's ideal for a number of the foliage species. Uh, the other thing to say, look, it's market led. And like I said, Jim will talk to you more and more about that later on, but uh, there's a volume export market, which, which uh, they're about. And um, we in Chagask are about in terms of trying to develop this enterprise. And there's a smaller uh, local market, which, you know, we, we can't ignore that either, but that is, that's being filled and that gets saturated fairly quickly um, if people aren't careful. So look, but we're about the volume market uh, today. I've only one or two points to make about the, the, the market. Uh, like I said, Jim is far more qualified to talk about that than I am. But just to say that, it, you know, there's a big EU market there in terms of flowers and foliage, 14 and a half billion, of which 1.3 is foliage. Now, that's not all Irish foliage. That's uh, tropical foliages and a whole range of other different types of foliages. We're, um, we can contribute to that as we do by exporting stuff uh, currently to the UK, where there's a, a 200 million um, market on the doorstep. <clears throat> and uh, closer to home, Board B have given us a figure in recent years of 78 million. Now that, that figure encompasses a wide range of um, Christmas foliages, Christmas trees, flowers, the whole gamut. So it's hard to get specifics, but there's, there's an Irish market, but um, we're, we're focused, like I say, on, on talking about the export market today. And currently, Irish foliage that is grown and exported makes its way to supermarket processors by and large. Uh, there's a lot of it now making its way as well to the UK and Dutch wholesalers. And uh, I've highlighted there um, 5% online. That's an emerging market, a growing market, and I guess it's one that's going to, to expand. I thought I'd just put this up to, again, put things in context. We, we, we tend to work towards this, what we call the cut foliage model in trying to develop this sector um, where you have production, we have research and KT, KT being knowledge transfer, and of course the market. And it's like a, a three-legged stool where, you know, they all work in tandem. And if one leg of the stool runs a bit, is a bit shorter than the other, you know, we could run into difficulty. And that's something we're always very mindful of. And we do have, you know, a national group of the key stakeholders, including ourselves in Chagas. There's the department, there's Enterprise Ireland, Borbia, and there's the industry people as well. And, uh, you know, they sit to try and maybe bang heads together a couple of times a year to, to make sure we're, we're on the right track with, one, with where we want to go. And you can see the targets that we've set um, uh, in, in trying to move the sector forward. And I suppose just to say where we are right now and, and where we want to go um, uh, in relation to those targets we've just, we've just seen. We're at about 220 hectares. There's 12 million stems and it's worth about 7 million. And you can see there from the, from the image, you know, where the foliage is located. I mean, it's, it's anywhere from Kerry across to the southeast and up along the east coast. There's, there's farms and plantations. And that's generally done amongst about 25 uh, grower operations. Uh, forest produce, who you'll hear from in, in a little while, being the largest, but there's a number of other players, Lismore, Wexford, and um, Arbor Blooms. And, you know, the employment, we, we've set targets, and it is delivering in terms of jobs in, in some of these rural areas, which is, is very important. So what does it look like? This is a couple of shots here of... of, of a foliage in the field, laurel and eucalyptus, and we call these, um, you know, they're two of the big three, pittosporum being the, the other big player. There's a number of other cultivated types, olaria, senecio. These are all, I suppose they're garden plants that have been brought to the, the level of production for foliage on a field scale, and they're growing. We can't forget wild foliage. It's a big part of uh, certainly um, forest produce and, 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 and what Jim Costello is about and uh, he may elaborate on that, but rhododendron, noble fir, there's a number of others. They're all vital in the, in the foliage business. And there's a, a market for that material. Just a shot here of what, you know, what this kind of thing is like in the field. You know, youngsters or young people cutting stems to 
quite an exacting standard in terms of stem length and, um, and numbers. And that's what the, the market wants, quality blemish-free stems of a particular stem length. In terms of the grower, we want you know, crops, uh, cultivated crops that are you know, relatively low input, easy to harvest, and obviously will, will provide a profit. So if, you, if you're thinking about it, or if I'm advising anybody, you really need to be starting with a, you know, mineral soils by and large free draining, if possible. Um, sheltered, I've highlighted that there because <clears throat> from our experience, you know, that is, it's absolutely vital that you have sheltered land because we do not want uh, the wind tearing foliage to bits because you can't sell it. So shelter is, is key. Our experience, I suppose, over the last number of years in growing a number of the species we're, we're talking about is that they, they will do well on slope, uh, slope ground, obviously within reason. I'm not talking about you know, growing this on the side of a steep mountain, this is, you know, um, um, reasonably good land that may have a slope 20, 30 degrees. And that helps with frost if there is, if there is an issue with frost because it can drain. But um, I'd be suggesting that we try and avoid uh, frosty areas. Sites need to be accessible. South facing is desirable, even though it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be south facing. But uh, protection from rabbits is, is important. And when it comes to maybe site preparation, I'll just run through the, the, the main agronomy features. Um, you know, it's no different to a lot of establishing any other, whether it's a veg crop or a fruit crop, you know, the standard agronomy practice uh, used to prepare land. Uh, because we're talking about perennial crops that are going to be in the ground for a number of years. Um, bottom right hand corner there, I call this the, the Kerry system. And I, again, we must give credit, I think, to Jim Costello and, you might want to tell us a bit more about this later on, but it's a system given the, you know, the rainfall levels we do have here in the, in, in, in the Southwest. Uh, we do have to adapt um, our growing systems given our, our land quality at times. So a very simple system that's been developed where, you know, there's a furrow plowed every four or five feet, depending on the species. And that allows, you know, drainage of excess rainfall uh, at times when there is a lot of water falling. And that's very often. Um, so production systems, yeah, look, I think depending on the, the gear somebody has or the, the, the machinery, you know, you can make things fit in to, to, to work around that. And in this instance, the picture on the left shows, you know, grass strips, which can be maintained by cutting once or twice in the season. And then, um, you know, the raw foliage down in between. Uh, in recent years, we've been looking at developing um, a fabric um, system where, where we were growing and some of this shrubbier material at higher density. And that can be a bit more difficult when it comes to weed control and, and the fabric helps certainly in that regard. Uh, propagation of plant material. I mean, look, if anyone is, is growing foliage, you're planning to grow foliage, you have to plan well in advance and it means you've got to propagate plant material. You, you, it's not a question of going to the nearest um, garden center or plant propagator, it has to be commissioned. Um, because it is specialist stuff and um, there's a long enough run in period to get that right. Planting is done by hand at about 1200 trees per acre, uh, labor intensive, but um, that's what we're, we're forced to do at the moment until such time as we maybe get a system where we can mechanically transplant. Weeds are an issue. Um, they're a big issue and they're, they're an issue even though we're, we're battling with them every day and trying to come up with techniques to, to, to combat weeds but they are probably the biggest challenge when it comes to growing foliage. And, you know, whilst there's sophisticated sprayers and tractor mount equipment to, to look after some aspects of weed control, um, I draw your attention there to the man with the knapsack and the mask in the top right hand corner. If, 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 if you're not prepared to do that when it comes to growing foliage, um, it's probably not something for you because you know, a lot of the time it does command spot treatment of weeds when, when things start to get, to get dirty and out of control. <clears throat> uh, pest issues, the, the picture earlier on showed, you know, we don't, there's no tolerance, there's zero tolerance when it comes to, to blemishes and holes. But what we're trying to do as part of our development work 
is you know fit in with the the, the the laws that are there now under sustainable use directive and IPM integrated pest management where we we monitor for pests by and large and then we only you know we we apply or we we have an intervention with 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 a pesticide if necessary pruning is a big part of management and uh, this is an annual job for a number of the species uh, because you want to regenerate the the the, the um the species to, to provide stems of suitable length, specification and quality that I talked about earlier on an annual basis. Harvesting, again, is all hand work, um, labor intensive, uh, but there's no other way. And um, this is what needs to be delivered in order to, 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 to um, deal with these, um, these high standard markets. Uh, material is shift from, brought in from the field situation where it might be, you know, graded into smaller bunches or by and large it's put into, you know, it's a commodity product going out in, in, in big volume in, in buckets, as you can see here on a Danish trolley and shipped uh, in a refrigerator container. So um, that brings me to the last slide, I suppose some might see this is maybe the most important slide. It's, it is important. I'm just giving you one example here of, you know, the likely costs and returns that are, that are in this business. I'm picking Pittosporum, which is, you know, one of the key ones for export. And this is where it's, you know, picked or harvested, bundled, like you could see, onto trolleys, into the warehouse, and then uh, for shipment uh, further on. So we're talking about establishment takes two to three years. In the case of Pittosporum, other species are a little bit faster, but Pittosporum takes three to four years. Uh, the plants, uh, plant material is the biggest cost, but you can see there that that 2,000 euros in year one, uh, uh, part of that is the ground preparation, the um, fertilizer and any weed control and rabbit fencing, which I'm suggesting is, a, is, a, is an absolute prerequisite in growing foliage. Uh, the, the second and third years then where there's um, um, a cost in maintaining it brings a total of 2,500. The returns, like I say, will kick in from year four and they'll continue it with a perennial crop like this for hopefully if the crop is reasonably well managed for, a, for the next um, eight to 10 years. There's an output, um, everything is on a per stem. We talk about everything on a per stem basis when it comes to foliage. Um, and you can see there 3,200. There's costs involved in, in getting that on trolleys and to the market. Uh, but look, at the end of the day, we're talking about, on average, about 850 net profit per acre for a species like eucalyptus or, or pittosporum. And maybe just to note that, you know, we, 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 we have plantations that do far better than 40,000 stems, and we have plantations that do an awful lot worse than 40,000 stems. So there is a mix, but look, that's what you're looking at with, with, with a business. It's all down to management and um, looking after it. There is grant aid available um, from the department in terms of establishment, and that's something maybe we can talk about later on if, if you want. Um, BPS stands for the Basic Payment uh, Scheme, and um, foliage is compatible with that scheme. So that may very well be an additional income for people that are, that are, um, that are interested. Um, just to touch on R&D, and I've only a couple of slides just uh, to say it's an important part of the development. It's one of those legs of that the, 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 the stool. Um, we have two arms. There's, there's work in Kildalton College and in some field sites where we're developing agronomy trials to bring forward those blueprints for the production. We've done it for eucalyptus, we've done it for pittosporum, and we continue to bring forward new species. Uh, which will become part of the, the, the foliage offer uh, as, we, as we move forward. Um, New Leaves is a project that was funded by the Department of Agriculture. Um, very grateful for their support in the last three years to up the, the kind of ante on what we've been doing in terms of eucalyptus in particular and developing um, new, new species, if you like, to, to compete in the market, higher yielding species and propagation of those species. <clears throat> <clears throat> just, um, just uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of work in bringing forward a, you know, a new species, and that, and that's why, you know, some people will argue this business is taking its why it's time to get going. But, you know, we we have to get things right, and it, we've been starting from a zero base in a lot of cases, taking what would have been a, a garden shrub, which would have been picked up by the the people interested in this from the market, 
And we then go back and, and try and put together a, a production blueprint. And that's where we you look at plant density, try and perfect that and get the optimum number of stems growing per hectare or per acre. Uh, there's a pruning regime, there's a herbicide program, there's pests and diseases that we have to monitor and, and look out for. And that's, that's, what's, um, that's what needs to be done in order to bring a species to, to the market. Um, you know, I mentioned the Kildalton work. We have a plot there of about a hectare of 100, 150 species that we're screening uh, on a regular basis, uh, bringing the market to see what's there, what does, in our, uh, does well in our climate. And then if they, if they see a gap for whether it's, a, you know, there's a gap at the moment for autumn foliages, whether it's berries or purple toned colored foliages, um, we've, we've, we've put them into a program and tried to bring them to the stage where they're ready for, for development or for expanding. And we have a couple of these at the moment on the runway, things like white gila, things like rose hip, um, and um, they're, they're more or less ready for, for the off. Uh, part of that work, we've, we've also developed one or two <laughs> flower fillers. I mentioned them earlier on, they're part of the whole business, but uh, whilst we're focused on the green fillers, are the foliage fillers, there is flower fillers as well. And there's, there's, there's options for, for, for doing a little bit of this as part of uh, the, the foliage development. So my final slide, Barry, is just to say, look, we have, you know, um, compiled the work that's been done in a series of, of fact sheets. They're available. Uh, they're, they're, they're available on the, 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 the Chagas website. Um, and you can access that information. Um, we also, in, in, in the days when we were able to have, have outdoor meetings, we, we, we have had workshops and, and field events. And look, we look forward to the, to the in, in, in future, getting back to, to, to some more of those events. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Andy, thanks a million for that, Andy. That's a fantastic overview of, of the whole area of the research and the uh, knowledge transfer that you're involved in in this whole area. So a lot, lot of work going on there. Uh, I know you're going to move on the slides for Jim, and just a reminder for everyone <clears throat> there that there's a Q&A function there at the bottom of the screen. If you want to put any uh, questions to Andy as he's, uh, as he's uh, uh, based on what he spoke about there, feel free to do that. And uh, Jim is coming up next. So Jim, over to you. Jim, Jim Pasco from Forest Produce. Thanks, Barry. Uh, <clears throat> just quickly going through a few slides here. We have about 350 acres under the company's direct management. Um, the second point about doubling the 30 million stems. At present, the company exports about 32 million, but if you divide it between wild foliage and cultivated, about 80% of the cultivated is grown in Ireland, and we buy about 20%, which started um, <clears throat> from Portugal and Italy, and that started after <clears throat> the sequel to the 2009 and 2010 severe frost, where we were badly damaged. But it works very well because uh, their production comes in different and it complements us and allows us to um, <clears throat> give an all year round supply to customers. Our main speciality is Christmas. Uh, we're pretty good at it. Uh, <clears throat> we were trained by Marks and Spencers. They, 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 they were the leaders at the time and uh, we specialize in decorated and woodland products. So on the market front, two main divisions, wholesale and retail. We're in the retail. It's very important if you're going to grow foliage to know, position yourself. Uh, the wholesale feature, main feature is it's, um, it's easier to access insofar as that uh, if you don't show up, it's not the end of the world. But in retail, or, or we have given commitments 12 months in advance. So it's great, you have the orders and you can build the business. But the downside is you have to supply. And it's very important to understand that. And it's mainly the difference is the, um, the different demands in the supply. Both markets need innovation, uh, the wholesale and the retail. Uh, it's a fashion industry basically and uh, so that's it so the environment is huge always has been from the very start we were one of the first nps companies which is a, a dutch equivalent of, of organic or whatever you want to call it but uh, we're now global gap which is, which is the if you like the gold standard of, of growing any crop in the world 
and um, we have pretty low carbon footprint. A lot of work going on, and we touched on it in, in to try and meet the uh, ever increasing exacting standards on, on pest control. And Andy then mentioned about the new foliage species and new products. Uh, we are very customer focused. So this is part of the innovation that we're going, we, we, we attempted where we do a mix of foliage in a bunch and it's done in association with flowers maybe grown in Kenya to, to, to deliver a bouquet and the customer will do that. But we haven't made any progress on that because we don't have, we just don't have the product. So this is a company that we work very close with. It's called Bloom and Wild. They've now grown substantially into Europe, UK company, uh, <clears throat> high tech people, wouldn't have any horticultural background, but they, they are coming up with incredible ways. It's this letterbox system of delivering a bouquet, very, very smart, very clever. Uh, so we're, we're, we're very happy to be working close with them. In our own place in, in Tralee, and we also rent a place in Holland, we do decoration. As I said, we're a Christmas company. We do all sorts of scented foliage at Christmas, glitters, they're all uh, biodegradable and <clears throat> water-based dyes and colorants. And um, so that's an area that we just can cope with the demand, huge growth potential. Also, we, we, I think we said as part of the strategic objective, we have to go for added value. And there is great opportunity here for doing, you know, like Finnish table centers at Christmas. Um, supermarkets are making it easier now to, to pick up and, and uh, led by, I have to say, Lidl and Aldi, they're easy to, to deal with. But there are opportunities here for growers. This should be done at grower level. Barriers, um, our biggest competitor has been the forestry because um, uh, the, the entry cost is zero. The state funds the establishment 100% and there is an annual payment. Um, in our business, you, you, you have to finance the growing of it, but you also have to wait three years. Um, the technical, no, none of it is, is difficult, but it's exacting in terms of time. And Andy, Andy will, 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 will you know, if, if you if don't have any technical knowledge, that should not be a barrier. Just you have to have an interest in it. And risk, of course, is growing. Most growers can't afford to take that. And then we have quite a lot of aging growers. Some of them age like myself. We need a, a, an injection of young people into it. Um, we, we need to offer a competitive alternative to other schemes. And I'm addressing this at young people. And I think one of the things that's loud and clear from survey work Young people will not be like their forefathers who wait until the harvest to get paid. They want to be paid every Friday night so they can go to the disco or whatever with their friends. Um, we have to facilitate new entrants. You know, we have to put supports there that uh, a young person who is interested in it, um, we need an induction program where they're, 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 they're paid for a period uh, while they're learning. And, uh, the state support has improved. Uh, the Department of Agriculture has been good at uh, grant aiding in crop establishment. But we need other, as I said, state support in terms of um, income for the people. So, yes, the market is open. We, we, we cannot cope with the demand. We're turning away uh, orders because we just can't meet them. And, um, Andy's work is vital. He, he has done amazing work, as you would have seen, and uh, he has been uh, doing this virtually on his own since the, the get-go. So he's to be complimented on that. But we need to take his work now into, if you like, pilot level, where we have to go into a drawer and, 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 and try these new varieties and help them get over the barriers which assuredly are there. What we're looking for is people who have an appetite for work. Um, they, you don't have to know anything about uh, horticulture. Some of our best scores were people who 
were had no background. One had a pub one time, another guy was a wine merchant, and another person was a banker. So the fact that you don't have a background in horticulture, that's no, no barrier. We can organize the money. I'm sure we can organize the land, but it's the capability. So we, we need people who are willing to work and work with us. And we, we, we will work on schemes that will get you in. So that's it, Barry. Okay, thanks a million for that, Jim. That was brilliant. You're a practitioner, you're at the coal face, you're doing it, you understand the market, you understand what's needed. So it's a, it's a, and there are opportunities there. And I think Andy put it really in, in perspective there as well that it's worth 78 million to Ireland, uh, you know, and out of a European market of 14.5 billion. So there's a real opportunity out there at the moment. Um, so a few questions coming in, and just to remind you, if Andy, if you want to stop sharing the screen there, thanks. Uh, if uh, there's a few questions coming in there as well, if any of you want to put questions to any of the panelists here, you can do it through the questions and answers there at the bottom tab, and we'll put them to to both Jim and to Andy as well. A uh, question that came in there, Andy, are there Department of Agriculture grants available to get involved in this? Yeah, there, there is, Barry. Um, there's, we have the Commercial Horticultural uh, Grant Aid Scheme, which is an annual scheme. It's, um, it's now a year three out of a five-year program. <clears throat> and that's, um, that supports growers, uh, commercial horticultural growers, um, including foliage. And there is supports there for, for anything from plant material uh, through to equipment, um, pack houses, buildings, um, you name it. But it's all... It, it, has to be part of a plan. There's terms and conditions that have to be met, um, but um, it's there, and that support is very, very important and, and has worked well uh, for those that have availed of it in the past. And at what rate is that handy? Is it a 40, 50% grant? That's a 40% grant, grant rate, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and there's another question for you there, Andy, as well. That are your figures are on a cost, uh, they're based on a per acre basis, isn't that correct? That's right. Okay. Um, Jim, is the European market for cut flowers and foliage expected to grow further in the short and the long term future? Sorry? Uh, the, the European market for, for foliage, is it expected to grow further in the short and long term future? In the, 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 is the market expected to grow? Is the market fair to grow? Uh, is it expected to grow? Absolutely. Um, as Andy said at the start, we, we're, we're, we're a safe pair of hands when it comes to the, the big processors in Europe because of the climate. Okay, we had, we had, we had a <coughs> setback in 2009, 2010, but as Andy pointed out, it is the best place in Europe to grow foliage. It's the safest place, and that's what they want. They want security of supply. It's very important. Yeah, I think at a time when we're seeing overproduction in a lot of other farm uh, agricultural commodities, it's good to see an area where there's uh, a, a large increase in demand. And um, what kind of a lead in time is required to get cut foliage onto the market? Um, for somebody who's considering getting involved in it today, maybe this is for you, Andy, as well. For somebody who's thinking of getting involved in it, is there a long lead in time? Or can you work with some of those propagators or those companies at the start to get the material? Uh, before you start propagating your own? Um, yeah, look, uh, I would be suggesting based on our experience that you, you, you know, you, you, you buy in material if you're going to get in, you get, get into it. Propagating your own is, is challenging. There's, there's particular skills in, in propagating um, plant material and uh, you need to have, you know, you need to have everything in, in order for that to, to, to work right. And there is specialist propagators that, that are very competitive and can you know compete and provide this material at, at, at very good cost. Um, yeah, the example I presented was pittosporum. That's that takes three to four years. But in the meantime, I'd be suggesting that Jim Jim has put out a you know the 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 idea there that there's there's work in this business, whether it's whether you travel to it or there may there may be some wild foliage in the in, in your locality that might be suitable to, to, to cut and harvest and bundle. I don't know, but I mean, that's something that could be discussed. Uh, we need 
workers in this business and people that are prepared to get out, get the hands dirty. And I think if there's if there is wild foliage in the locality, it's something that should be 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 looked into whilst you know you're waiting on maybe some of the cultivated species to kick in. Okay. Uh, just Barry, one point on that is a, a practical example. We have 40 acres we will have developed this year in West Limerick on a top class site. So the land is there, the owner has put money into it, the money is there, the capital is there. And the ideal scenario from our point of view is to parachute in a grower or somebody that will go in and take over that crop, manage it as it should be managed, and they can make a pretty good income. And uh, Andy and I discussed this. We would afford them training, and it's not rocket science. Andy has a very easy blueprint. So that's the kind of, so money or land is not the problem at the moment. What is the problem is capability. Somebody to go in, to move down, as I said, to, to West Limerick and take over that farm and say, I, I will do this. And uh, we, we pay them in the meantime as well while they're, while they're learning. So that, that's Jimmy, a, a pretty good example. And Jim, you're at 550 acres at the moment in Ireland. How far can you go with that? I know you said is, uh, the demand is is increasing all the time and you can't meet your supply contract, but how far can you go? How many acres? We, we have uh, the, the plan, uh, the company's official plan is to go to 1200 acres. And, uh, but that's, uh, if you like, um, preconditioned on the fact that we will get these people to come in in the areas. And uh, Andy and I are working on what is actually a unit. You know, what, what is a unit? That, you know, it's the best way to learn. Then you can go back to where you came from and if you have land and do it yourself, you know, develop your own on your own land. And so this is a, a free, if you like, and cheap way uh, of learning. And also then you can bring whatever skills you acquire back into where you're from, into your yeah. own land. Jim, a question that came in for you, do people get directly in touch with you to discuss opportunities similar to what you're looking at for in Limerick? I uh, presume they, they can contact Forest Produce or go on to your Google your Yes, website. if they contact, uh, the, I think there is a michelle at forestproduce.ie. That would be the email. Yeah, I'll Google the website. Another question that came in for you there, Jim. Uh, has Jim's company ever worked with flower farmers in Ireland? And if not, would he be interested in discussing opportunities to supply Irish grown flowers with his foliage? Well, the, you see, this is where the opportunity is there to, to we, we showed a slide there where you had foliage and flowers mixed together. And it certainly, uh, it certainly is a potential for the future. There are some good flower growers who are more in the wholesale business and doing excellent work. We have, I live in Chile and we have some really good people here growing, you know, small scale, high value flowers into um, the wholesale market. And that's certainly um, it, it's great, you know, but our market demands, you know, although I think we could start with Irish supermarkets, they, I'm sure we could make a deal where they would take a guaranteed number. But look, everything is open for discussion. And I think the more people work together, the better. Another question there, Jim. <clears throat> I've been trying to experiment with cut foliage as a young farmer. However, where would we find resources uh, or where would you find resources that advise and advice to plant or trends or where do we purchase these plants from? Sorry? Did you get that one, Andy? Um, no, yeah. just, just repeat that one, Barry, again. You're uh, is, is it, it, somebody it, it, that's interested in, 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 in yeah. buying plant material again, is it? A, a young farmer is trying to experiment with cut foliage for the last while. He's, where would he find resources and advice of what what to plant and what the trends are, and where okay. to purchase the plant material from. Yeah, well, look, it's you can you can maybe look back on this recording. I've mentioned a number of the the species there, but we do have if if they want to go to to our own website, Barry, I direct them there. We have a number of fact sheets. There's one there specifically on the on the back of the screening work that was done in Kildalton. There's a whole there's a whole range of suitable species mentioned in that particular that particular fact sheet um, but look um, our plan is to have some open events again at Kildalton you know when things open up a little bit more and we'll be if, the, if that person wants to leave their name and number we can put them on the on the list and invite them along when that will occur 
Yeah, very good. Uh, the question came in there, and I suppose sustainability comes up quite a bit here. Um, you know, and uh, there was some use of chemical weed killers there in, in, in some of the sides that you use there. So the question is, is there any market for organic native varieties of cut foliage? And with the comment that surely propagating an invasive species like rhododendron and the use of chemical weed killers is in direct opposition to environmental protection. Well, could I answer that one? We, we, we recognize rhododendron is an obnoxious weed, period. And, uh, you know, that the, we fully support the state policy of its eradication. But we believe that money can be made by people to manage the, the, the rhododendron because it's not been eradicated despite millions being spent on its eradication. It simply is not working. So we believe that uh, there should be an eradication plan that that part of which is funded out of the, um, the sale of the foliage. Uh, it would take quite a while, but uh, it needs a plan. And certainly regarding native plants, uh, unfortunately, uh, there aren't many of our natural plants that you can scale into um, a level that people can make a, a good week's wages from, 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 from growing. Uh, there are a few, of course, like bog myrtle and stuff like that, which we are actually cultivating now, and he's doing trials on it. Um, the, the, um, and I, 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 I don't really get this native versus farm. You know, it's a kind of form of racism, of plant racism, I call it. Uh, you know, that if, if we're in the middle of climate change, that's been going on. We, people forget we've had an ice age just 10,000 years ago. And uh, there will be a movement of plants in and out. And uh, if you look at a tree like sycamore, uh, it's, it's, it's a farmer. And, uh, you know, it, it depends on how far back you want to go in, in defining native. Everything we have is only uh, about 10,000 years ago. So if you go back beyond that. But we're open to any suggestions. Regarding organics, yes, there is a huge interest in organic, uh, but unfortunately, the market doesn't seem to want to pay for the effort that goes into it. It certainly is worth going that road, for sure. Okay. Um, there's a question there in relation to cut foliage in the Midlands, North and the West. Now, I know you guys are mainly uh, located in the South West of the country, and of course, you're based in Waterford and, and Wexford as well. But uh, in the North and the uh, Northwest, is there opportunities there? Well, I think there are some species like laurel, which, you know, we are expanding the production of laurel. Laurel is a direct replacement for rhododendron. So the idea would be that if um, the rhododendron eradication plan could be formalized, uh, it would be phased out over many, over a number of years to be replaced by laurel. Now, laurel, you will grow in, in the Midlands. And again, it's something, you know, we are not saying no to anybody at this stage, you know, because we, we really need to get the production up fast. And the only difference between moving away from our centers in Kerry and Wexford is that it would have to be self-contained. In other words, um, uh, the, the grower would have to have sufficient capability to have a shed that he can store it and we can arrange to have it picked up. So, so no reason, and there, there are quite some hardy species that Andy would be able to advise that we grow in the Midlands. Okay. Andy, a question for you. Is this a module in the Chagas education program? Uh, is, it, is it covered anywhere in the, in the, in the training uh, in colleges? Currently, it's not a module, Barry. Um, what we tend to do is, depending on demand, we, we'll put on... Uh, specialist lectures like I've done this morning, if people want to, to focus, whether it's on propagation or it's on the, 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 um, the agronomy involved in pruning or weed control, we will, do, we will put on something specialist or arrange something for anyone that's interested. Currently, it's not a module, but the, 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 people, in the, 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 the people involved in developing the curriculum are looking at things like this going forward. Um, 
there is there is what they call these specialist modules, these smaller modules that they run, whether it's in Kildalton or the Botanic Gardens, and that is being explored all right. I suppose, Andy, if anyone has an interest, there's a lot of questions here about training in this whole area. So if anyone has wants to express an interest in training, you, they can express their interest to you, maybe by email. Sure. And, uh, and uh, your contact details are, are on this uh, presentation. And Andy's presentation and Jim's presentation will be available on chagas.ie forward slash farm business options um, later on this evening. So we'll, we'll upload that onto the, onto the website on yeah. the afterwards. Um, no, Andy, you want to come in there? I was just going to go back to the question, uh, you know, in regards to, you know, people that might be interested from the, the West and the Northwest. Like Jim says, look, we, 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 we talk to, to anybody, but I think there needs to be a, a scale of production if, you're, if you are going into this, that it's that minimum unit size again that, that Jim touched on. It depends on the species. I think you, you, you really do need to, to have an advantage if you're going to be growing something in Galway or Mayo. It needs to be something that will command an advantage over growing the same species somewhere else or that you have a volume of it or that there's a number of people, like-minded people in that vicinity prepared to get involved in a, in a project in order to be able to, to meet the spec and the demand that's there for it. But as Jim says, to be able to, to put it together and, 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 and deliver it to Tralee uh, in line with the structure and the, the, you know, the margin that's in this or that this, this, the market will allow. So that, that, that needs to be well planned. But I've no doubt that there is probably species that would grow, but... Um, it's it needs to be a team effort in order to get that to get that to happen yeah uh, thanks andy uh question for you jim are you looking for foliage going in northern ireland we're, we're no specific area or place it's just that um i think the uh, the company now uh, as i said i'm i'm uh, uh, it, it's not my decision, but I know there is a plan to open up a major distribution centre in Holland by the company. And in that way, uh, growers anywhere, because uh, once it's picked up, uh, but it will be few seed in Holland. You know, so once you have a centralised depot, it can be literally grown anywhere. But we are not the only people in the business. You know, there are other, I would certainly advise a person going into higher value floral uh, varieties, maybe if you look at the wholesale market, there are, there are plenty, um, it's not our business, but uh, very often it's a good way to start, learn how to grow it and sell it uh, into small scale wholesalers. And then uh, once you get to know it, come to us. We, we, we buy a lot in uh, Portugal and Italy because they're established growers who supply wholesale markets and supply us, and, and we're seen as, um, because we'll take volume, you know, so they're very happy, uh, but they will sell, uh, you know, uh, higher value products elsewhere. Okay, another question has come in here about, is it similar to forestry? Is, is profit from cut foliage tax exempt? Pardon? Is profit from cut foliage tax exempt? I presume it's not. Uh, no, but if, if if we're developing an interesting model, if you have money and you've land, but you have no capability, but if you offer that uh, land and it's a crop they're on uh, to rent, once it's rented beyond seven years, then you'll come under the, um, the farm kind of retirement scheme. So that will allow in young people in to take it, up, take it over. But um, th that's a question that has come up often um, the, 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 the tax situation there relates to forestry, which is income from standing timber. So if you if you if you sell the crop standing, but you know that it's a grey area, and it's I think every case has to be taken on its own. So I would advise them go to their accountant. Um, uh, certainly, if you're selling it into florists or local markets, it's not tax free. But if you sell it standing on the trees, there's some chance. Okay. Uh, a question came in there, maybe it's for you, Andy, as well. Um, during my research, I came across a grey area for the grant application for plant material. Christmas trees are exempt from grant aid for obvious reasons, but we grow noble fir exclusively for cut foliage production. So would this be eligible for grant funding for new planting? 
we sell to the domestic market, but the majority of our sales are for the export market. Yeah, look, I don't have a direct answer for that. I, yeah, Christmas trees are not in that program, but you know, um, and it's, it is slightly grey, but I think, I mean, I would advise maybe put it in as part of a plan and put it forward if it's, if it's, if they want to develop that business and uh, it's going to include Noble Fur. Uh, the department are very open to, uh, they, they will look at each case individually and um, perhaps they'll see a case for support. I don't know. Uh, that's it's it's their call, but they have been very, very innovative in the way they've they've um, they've supported the the development of our of the cut foliage industry to date. I presume that what he means here is that you'd be getting one hundred percent grant from Noble for going from the forestry crop. Which, Perhaps, yeah. Okay, okay. It's, uh, Jim, are you uh, have you any answer on that particular one that seems to be a bit of a grey area there? Well, I do know that in, in Scotland, where we, we do some work with a group up there, um, they were granted by the forestry for going no before. It was on the basis that it would be managed under a new regime. They're managing it as a kind of um, um, uh, complete cover forestry where the trees are topped and they're managed. And uh, the forestry seem to be happy enough with it, you know. Uh, they see it as... Um, as a non-wood forest product. So I think the forest service here would be quite open to, to any um, <clears throat> suggestion or proposal as to how um, you can commercialize trees, you know, and would suggest the person to contact the local forest inspector. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's a good suggestion. Um, it was, and the similar question that we got before is cut foliage restricted to production in the south of the country? I suppose you've answered that. It's, you're, you're open to any area in the country. Um, I suppose it's about getting the right grower and uh, you want to make sure that the grower is going to do what they're being asked to do as well because you're very prescriptive as the way sites should be managed and if they're not managed the way they should be managed, you won't be producing the quality produce that uh, meets the market requirement or required to meet the market requirement. Um, what are the names of the, of the suppliers to purchase the plant material that Andy spoke of? Yeah, uh, there's a number of plant propagators um, if, that are in the nursery stock business here in Ireland, Barry. There's, there's a number of them. We have a list on our website again, so we can, I, I'll direct them to, rather than specifically mentioning any one in particular, I'd rather they go to the website and look at the names on there. Okay. Uh, another question in relation to the chemical use of uh, chemical uh, use of chemicals. The impact on soil health from glyphosate is significant and well documented. So, do we need to move away from this approach? Maybe Andy. Well, I know Jim, you have it's a pet subject of yours. If you want to take that, but look, as far as I'm concerned, there's a place, um, you know, in commercial horticulture and in tillage. Uh, there's a necessity for using some chemistry at particular times, and um, we're in the we're in the business of growing to make profit. Uh, it's commercial, and you know if you don't use certain materials, using them correctly at the right time, you'll end up with problems. Uh, it, it, there'll be it, there is alternatives, but there at the moment the research would suggest that a lot of the alternatives are too are, are far they're too expensive. They don't work, and um, you know th there's probably an awful lot more research needs to be done. But right now, I'm afraid we have to stay with what what the science is telling us and what we know, and what works. Uh, I think also we have to look at the idea of what are weeds. You know, <clears throat> um, and maybe Andy and I might be slightly different views on this one, but I, I think I would call some weeds companions of foliage crops. So. If you can encourage, nature will not, will not accept the vacuum, so the space has to be covered. So even if you use Roundup ad infinitum, you're going to, once you create a vacuum, worse weeds will come in. So we are doing some work on, on using um, cover crops. I agree totally with Andy. Uh, you, you, know, you, you do need some chemicals to kill briars and nettles and stuff like that, which can really destroy your crop. But when you do it, you have to tolerate a replacement crop. You know, 
So we are doing some interesting work and there's a lot of work going on in America with cover crops associated with foliage. So these are these are, are, are what were, would have been known as weeds, but who don't really damage the crop. But what they do is they keep out the bad the bad guys. So there's a there's a, that's an area that a lot more work needs to be done on. You know, yeah. and certainly we would support any research that's been done to try and identify because whether we like it or not, Roundup is on the way out. Glyphosate is going to go. And uh, as Andy said, there are very few alternatives to, 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 to Roundup, you know, okay. that work. There are a lot of proposed alternatives, but none work. Just some clarification needed on the sites that you mentioned earlier on. You spoke about sites in the southwest and the northwest. And um, are you looking mainly for uh, coastal and frost free sites? Well, I think that we, we learned a lot in 2009 and 2010. Where Andy lives in Kinmare, which is the Bambi southwest, uh, the trees there got wiped out, Kinsporum. But yet, where I'm up here in Tralee, north of Tralee, at 600 feet above sea level, it survived, which astounded us. So we're finding that elevation is a very important thing. Don't be down in a hole in a frost hollow. But Andy also mentioned the downside of being up high is you then run into the, the problem with wind. So you, you need shelter. And we are looking at providing artificial shelter beds now, you know, planting radiata pine and stuff like that. But the ideal place is up out of a frost hollow. And um, uh, so that, that's important. You, you don't go down into holes. Okay. And I think you can move a good bit inland. Okay, okay. Um, question here. I'm a small, fla uh, small flower and foliage grower in the east. Is it possible to get cuttings of Oleria, Wygela, Silver Sussex, Rose Hips, etc., to propagate myself? It's certainly yeah. if you if you if you learn the skills, I have we I've known one or two growers who did provide their own plants, you know, and some species are much easier than others. But I think Chagas has an excellent video done by Jim Kelly. I don't know, Andy, you might be able to comment on, on how to on, on how to propagate. But it, it, as Andy pointed out, it's not as easy, but certainly worth having a go. Okay. But the, the plant material, I think that was that was the gist of the question, Barry. Yeah. This guy is looking for a source of material. Yeah, look, that we can talk to them about that. Okay. We have a good few questions to, to go through here, so we try, and we've only a couple of minutes. So, uh, another question that came in here: We use Shropshire sheep as an effective weed control measure on noble fir, only taking them off during the budding season. Have you tried similar on eucalyptus plantations? And if so, what was your experience? Have you tried Shropshire sheep on eucalyptus, Jim or Andy? It's something definitely that came up only recently, and um, we we will. We, what, we have no problem buying the Shropshire sheep, but we're looking again, it goes back to the growers. We're looking for somebody to manage them. Okay. Is there much? Yeah. Andy, did you want to say something there? No, I mean, we're, we're all far, you know, worth trying these techniques, but they need to be tried properly. Um, we simply don't have the time to do, do it all, but, yeah. you know, very open minded to all of this, and I'm sure there's a place for. For doing that and if it works then then win-win yeah I've heard, I've heard the mention before even around crops of willow using the tractor sheep so they, 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 they seem to be a good um, natural or uh, controller right uh, is there much uh, um automatic collection methods and inspections of the of the quality so the collection methods is it automated and the inspection in terms of the quality how is that done we don't have any, as a company, I don't know who anybody else operates, all our own, at the moment, stuff is brought to either the warehouse in Kerry or Wexford, and it's um, it's checked there, you know. But um, we would certainly, if there was sufficient volume, and as I said, when the Dutch depot gets going, would we will be able to, the most important thing is that uh, the person themselves are properly trained and they know the standards that are required. Okay, uh, Jim, uh, do farmers need to pay for a collection of the harvest to be delivered to forest produce? Right. Uh, do farmers need to pay for a collection of the 
harvest to be delivered to forest produce or for the delivery to forest produce? Yeah, well, they would, you know. It, normally, mo most of the, the production, as I said, we harvest it ourselves. So we, we don't do um, delivery. So we would be very interested in, in, in talking to somebody that has foliage and is prepared to harvest it themselves, manage it themselves, and deliver it. We, we, we certainly would would be very interested in that. Okay, there's a lot more. There's a, a lot more questions that have come in, and we can't get them to, to them at the moment. Uh, just a pointer: CIT or Cork Institute of Technology has a floriculture module. We welcome people to do a, a standalone uh, or MTU Cork, as it's now known. Okay, folks, thank you very much. That was very, very informative. Lots of questions put to you. A lot of interest in this webinar as well today. And uh, I want to thank my colleague Andy Welton from. Chagas Horticulture Development Unit. I want to thank Jim Costello. Jim, you've been a great soldier in this area for many years, and uh, I've, I've met you on numerous occasions, so um, very, very informative and very knowledgeable in this area as well. Um, thank you very, very much, both of you. As I said, this is the second last series, so the next week is our last series in the Farm Business Options um, until at least the end of the summer anyway. And uh, I'll be back, back with you again next week, uh, next Tuesday at 11 o'clock where we'll be talking about the use of insect farming, insect for food and insect for feed, should be interesting. So thank you very much for viewing. Thanks, Jim, and thanks, Andy. Talk to you again next week. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, Barry.